Next, we have a talk entitled Shipping at the Speed of Life by our home dude, Corey Donahoe from GitHub in the San Francisco's. He has two great dogs named Cindy and Denali. Uh, he has great barbecue at his house, and he probably enjoys walks on the beach, because who doesn't? Corey Donahoe. So this is called Shipping at the Speed of Life. It's basically a talk about how when you want to maintain a competitive advantage in like a really crazy market, how you can get features to users in a very fast way. And that's basically you know what we're going to go into today. This is me when my hair is shorter and I'm shaving. Uh, I work at GitHub. Um, do you guys all use GitHub? Most yeah. of you know it. I love working there. It's really fun to be able to work on a product that I use and so many people that I know use. Um, online, I'm at various places, uh, Avis.org, and I pretty much go by Avis on Twitter and GitHub and all those other places. Uh, so that's basically a little bit about me. Um, but this song is basically like the shipping culture at GitHub and how we really care a lot about getting features in front of people and fixing bugs quickly. We don't really like to let things leave. And so it's a little bit of the philosophy and how we talk or how we ship um, and why it's so important to all of us. So we, we love it so much that we've even made little images of this squirrel. And any time that we're kind of skeptical as to whether or not we should ship something, someone will paste this picture of the squirrel telling you to ship it in a campfire. And you realize that shipping shouldn't be this big scary thing. It should be funny and cute, like the squirrel. Um, and so the, the main thing is keeping GitHub.com happy and healthy. We need to be moving very quickly, we want to have a blast, and everything on GitHub needs to stay at a certain level that we think is acceptable. And to do this, communication is really, really important. Uh, we need to be able to know what everybody else is working on, we need to know what they're thinking, what's been deployed, what hasn't been deployed, why things were rolled back, um, but we need to respond. Um, we have days where crazy things happen and we need to be able to look at the system and we might even need to put something in temporary just to get through the day so everybody's uh, you know, experience on the site is, is at an acceptable level. And we do this by measuring like crazy. <clears throat> um, we measure you know, the performance of our applications, but we also measure the failures. We need to know as much information as we can about the system at any given time. And we've been doing this by building tools around our site. So we're not only building GitHub, we're building tools that allow us to keep GitHub at a certain level of you know, quality. And we, we built a few things that I'll cover a little bit later. And so with Ruby, you get this idea you know, with Ruby on Rails that out of nowhere, you're going to have this great application and everything is going to be cool. But once you kind of start to grow and get a larger user base, you, you actually have to work very hard. And at that point, Ruby's just the technology that you chose. You know, and we've discovered that you know, as more users come into the system, Ruby on Rails by itself isn't going to be able to handle all the workload that we have. And so we do this, and the way that we keep an idea as to like how everything is going on the site is we measure the front-end behavior. So we not only care about our new relevant response times, but we want to know how long it actually feels to the user to, um, you know, to, to load the web page. And so we use this site called Browser Mob, which is pretty cool because this is our Browser Mob load times from all over the world uh, with the CDN uh, provider Akamai. So we've been <coughs> trying different CDNs to push assets around the world in order to make sure everybody has a good user experience. And with Browser Mob, we were able to set up multiple tests that were pulling from all over the world, and we could see how long that page actually took to load uh, for, for different users. And this is Edgecast, another CDN we tried. And so you can see that, you know, this, this gives us insight that we wouldn't really have, you know. What do we do? Do we sit there and, like, refresh web pages and, like, look at, you know, why slow? That's, that's not really going to give us the geographic distribution we wanted. So a combination of browser mob and a few CDNs allowed us to measure, you know, the front end. Uh, we also use Pingdom, which is good for us as far as knowing whether the site's available. So, you know, certain parts of the site uh, have, have all sorts of various, like, you know, usefulness, but we, we want to be able to know which, which parts of the site are inaccessible from various parts of the world. And Pingdom does the same thing. Uh, it's pulling from a lot of places. 
Um, we also have to measure the back-end behavior. So, you know, the user experience is very important, but we need to be able to also know how all of the internal systems are growing. And we're not in the cloud. Like, Git is actually a very, very uh, IO-intensive uh, process. And so we can't get disks on a cloud provider right now that are going to be fast enough. And so we actually have to capacity plan. So unlike everybody jumping to the cloud because it's hip and fashionable, like we, we have to call somebody up and say, hey, we need a new pair of servers because we have to get pairs of servers because we run a high availability system and we need to be able to fail over. Um, and we use a tool called Collect D, which is really awesome. It's very old and the graphs aren't that sexy, but you can do all sorts of really cool stuff with it. And it, it allows you to really just, you know, get metrics on simple things. You know, it's like, how many rescue jobs can we do in this minute? Or, or all sorts of uh, little things. And it's nice to be able to collect that information. You may not need it right now, but it may be useful in a month or two. Uh, we use Nagios for monitoring and alerting. This is pretty standard stuff too, but you know, it allows you to set thresholds and say if you know, the CPU is pegged at, you know, the, the lower average is at 24, then that's not acceptable, and someone probably needs to log in and look at that system. Uh, we also do a lot of custom metrics. So we build stuff with Graphite and with Redis that just allow us to do counters. So like when we launched the Mac app a couple weeks ago, um, or I guess a month or two ago now, we, we had in place a way to find out just something simple like how many times did someone install the Mac app? And it was cool to know that within 24 hours, 24,000 people installed the Mac app, and that was awesome. And it, you know, it doesn't necessarily provide you much other than knowing that people liked it, and well, people installed it. And yes, we got 900 exceptions that day, but 24,000 people installed it, that's pretty awesome. <laughs> You know, and one of the big things that you know we have to do is communicate. So in order to ship fast, we use Campfire, and we use Campfire basically like a searchable log store. And we also use this native client called Propane, which is really cool because they have this folder that you can drop random JavaScript files in, and it can manipulate the DOM that is coming back from Campfire. So we do things like you know add grab bars, uh, all sorts of little things that we can just to make it a little bit cooler. Um, the big thing for us is searching campfire logs. Um, I could go in and search for you know, certain types of repo corruption, and I might find something from nine months ago where Ryan Tomeko went through and identified the error, talked about it, created an issue, and I can say, oh, if this happens again, then you know, something obviously changed. And that's really useful for us, rather than having to say, oh, well, you might want to talk to Ryan. He might remember it, but it's not working right now. Uh, he'll be on at 9 p.m. when you probably want to go have dinner. Um, but the cool thing about Campfire is they have this streaming API. So you can connect to it, and all the information that comes by uh, just streams um, right into your client. And this allows us to do this thing called Hubot. And Hubot is awesome. Um, he's basically a little Node.js bot that works with the Campfire streaming API, and he can listen to commands, and he can also do things on his own and spew, spew information to the channel. And that turns out to be really useful when we want to do things in a repeatable fashion, and we want everyone to be able to know about what we're doing. So Hubot can do all sorts of cool things, like he can open the door for you. So you can log in, you can walk up to the door of the office, log, open up Campfire and say, Hubot, door me. And all of a sudden the door buzzes and you're allowed to walk in. And it's just a little Arduino hack, but it was a whole lot of fun. You know, it's just like <laughs> that we were able to set up this Campfire bot to let us in, and it's great. And you, you can say, office me and he tells you who all is in the office. And it's just like a little SNMP app that checks for MAC addresses uh, on the router, but we're able to just say office me, and you see everybody's avatar for who's there that day. It's, it's pretty awesome. You can say image me a pug, and he'll go to Google Images and pull down one of the first 12 responses for pugs. Um, but Hubot also has this really cool functionality where he can do distributed execution. So we have like a dozen file servers. And when you want to run a command, you can say, Hubot, tell me the load on all the file servers. And Hubot goes and runs all these commands on the file servers, aggregates all the info, and pastes it back to Campfire. And suddenly we don't have to be, you know, I can, I can from my phone, if I get paged, I can ask Hubot what the load average is on these servers, and I don't have to be on VPN or have my laptop. And it's pretty rad. And the, the distributed execution does a whole lot of stuff, like memcache evictions, all, all sorts of rad information. But Hubot can do a whole lot more. Um, people often ask us if we're going to open source it and we want to, and we have a repo that we can do it, but we're not using it. And the functionality is being added to him so fast by all the people who work there that it's going to be very, we're basically going to have to like take a week off and do that exclusively in order to distribute this. How do you do it? A lot of people do it themselves. <laughs> um, but basically, to get the whole healthy and happy idea that is going on with um, you know, the goals of, of shipping, you need to know that like 
day to day, we're working really hard to understand the system and make the user experience great for everybody. And when you start to see how these tools work together, it's, it's pretty rad. Um, for us, we, we want to make our users really happy. And it's very important to us. And so we have uh, email support that people just email support at GitHub, and all of us see it. And we also keep an eye on Twitter. You know, we may not respond to everything that everybody tweets, but we, we see those messages come by. And we use that to gauge you know, how happy our users are. Um, and basically, once your site hits any certain number of users, errors are unavoidable. Stuff is just going to blow up. And you, you really need to just suck it up and deal with it. And get some idea as to how frequently those errors are happening. So we've developed an internal tool called Haystack, which is very much like Hoptoad, but catered a little more to uh, our environment. And it's not that hard uh, to, to build something like this. But so with, with Haystack, you can see the error rates over the last like 12 hours there. At the top, you can break it down by all of the different subdomain applications we have. And if you look at the bottom, the latest exceptions just stream in. So it's really cool when you ship something new to be able to go to Haystack and just see what types of errors you're doing in. And you start, after you look at it for a while, you start to see which errors are pretty common and unavoidable, like timeouts and things like that. And, you know, or why that service error is, is blowing up. But it, it allows you to really see which ones are crazy and, you know, that we should immediately fix and which ones are safe to, to just let go. But the cool thing is we can look at the most frequent errors. So if new code goes out and then I look the next day and it's like, well, we have a thousand errors of this type and it's related to the code that we shipped yesterday, you know, maybe we should go back and look and see if there's a bug in there and something that we can fix to avoid that. Um, but yeah, streaming in real time is wonderful for when you deploy new features. Um, and the big thing for us with Haystack is we're able to see if just a few users are experiencing problems or if like many users are impacted. You know, is, is everything blowing up and going crazy or is it just, you know, someone has a really weird repo or, you know, that pull request just has like a broken foreign key and that's why it's blowing up. So, you know, that's why that one's exploding. But we, we want to make sure that if something's impacting a lot of people that we get on it really fast. Um, you know, this allows us to respond to the failures that we may miss. You know, a lot of times you just kind of push things out there and cross your fingers and hope that, you know, stuff's going to work, and that really doesn't apply for us. You know, we need to be able to respond, and we need to know, you know, how things are blowing up in order to fix them in a timely fashion. Um, we also use a tool called Jenkins for continuous integration. So it's, it's an amazing, amazing tool. It's a job tool. Um, but for us, we use Git branches a lot. And so Jenkins builds every branch all the time, anytime we commit on any app that we have. And this will come back to be pretty cool in a minute. Um, but at any time, we can say, hey, Hubot, what's the status of GitHub, you know, Haystack 2? And he'll be like, it's green. And he'll give you a link to the build up. Um, so Jenkins CI is wonderful. It has a really solid back end. You don't have to, like, having used CI Joe and, you know, and integrity and all those things over the last couple of years, I, I really like how well it, it just works. Um, and it has an acceptable API. So for us, when we switch to Jenkins, we need to be able to go in and basically pull the internals out from underneath all the developers who've been there for a year and put Jenkins in, but make it so they didn't notice. And the API allowed, it, uh, allowed us to do that. We were able to go in and basically not change the campfire interaction for the developers, and it was, we just kind of plugged it all into Hubot and everything worked out really well. Um, and how it works is GitHub basically hits this middleware application that we have called Janky. And so Janky gets a, a webhook, and we get information from GitHub, like a compare URL for that change set, what branch it was, what SHA it was, and we store all of that information in Janky. Janky, in turn, dishes a build request off to Jenkins with a few parameters that tell it like, what SHA needs to be built and stuff like that. And Jenkins has a web notify API, so when the build finishes, it gets back to Janky. And Jakey says, okay, that build that was for this branch at this SHA was successful or failed. And then Jakey tells Hubot, and Hubot tells us in Campfire. It seems kind of complex, but it's actually really simple. Um, but it, it works very well. Um, and so we sort of do this continuous deployment thing, but a lot of people are like, you know, you're, you, you aren't doing it unless your, your CI is deploying for you. And that doesn't actually work for us. Um, and I'll, I'll explain a little more why in a second. But, you know, as long as you're getting things out, and into your user's hands quickly, and there isn't this complex review process of you trying to do things, you just want to be able to fix. Those are just errors, you know, and it's like we are fixing them, they're gone, they're running away. Um, we use New Relic really, really uh, aggressively. We've 
basically implemented all sorts of weird extra stuff in New Relic in order to get good metrics on some of our uh, network-based stuff. Uh, but we use Brum, which is really cool. It's very similar to a browser mob, so it breaks it down, and you can see you know, how much is spent DOM processing over the network and in the web application. And this is what we really care about. You know, our average response time is 40 milliseconds, and we know that that's not what our user experience is. So tools like this, in addition to browser mob, let us know how things look. And if we see differences between the systems, we know that something's up. Um, and it also has this thing called Actix, which is rad. So I know that people in South America and Australia like, you know, it's kind of okay, but Asia is kind of crappy, and you can just look at it, and it's just wonderful information to know that these people are not having a great user experience. And this information like this led us to do a whole bunch of research on all the available CDNs. Um, we can also get subsystem breakdowns. So I can see how much of those request queuing, GC, memcache, you know, all external is basically our IPC layer that talks to the different uh, backend file servers. And that took a little bit of instrumentation, but you know we can look at it, and when we see various spikes, we know that you know something probably changed, or maybe somebody committed some non-conforming code, and we really need to go back and look at that. And when we need to, it's even cooler because you can break it down, and you can see you know the class and the method that's being called. So you can say, oh wow, you know the commits controller show is using 38% of the time. What's going on in there? You know, and so you, you have a good place to dive in when you have performance problems, and it's, it's super, super useful. Um, we also use this tool called uh, Silverline by the guys at Labrato. Labrato is kind of like if nice in Unix actually works. Um, because what you can do is break things down, and this is a basic front end for us. And we have all of these groups like Camo, or proxies, github.com, jobs, assets. Um, we, we can throw all of them onto a system and say, okay, Camo only gets 50 megs, but GitHub.com has four megs for unicorns, and it can have 80% of the CPU utilization. And you can break these things down into memory and CPU uh, resources, and you get really awesome graphs. Uh, so you can see, you know, here's a CPU one, here's memory, so you can see all these different pieces and how much they're using, and what's cool is they won't cross a threshold. They have this awesome thing called like an event API. So when anybody crosses the threshold, you can have um, reactionary scripts run. So it's just like, we have a script that's just looking for the, the git killer, where if we get a whole bunch of git processes that all happen at once, the box will kind of deadlock. And this is where it actually happened. Um, but we had all of these things go up, and the, the resident memory in these processes that we weren't accounting for were there, and then this process kicks in and just kills them until it's back underneath the threshold that you've set. This was actually something that we tracked down last year when we had file server issues where every morning between 7 and 8 a.m. Pacific, um, this one file server would fall on its face. And we had no idea why. And unfortunately, I had deployed code relating to that, and I had to prove to everybody that the code I deployed didn't actually cause the errors we were seeing. So I got to camp out for two days until I found out what was really going on. But Labrato was wonderful in identifying that it was uh, a process that we hadn't put into a container. And as a result, it was going off and doing whatever the hell it wanted. We're also using Graphite now, which is relatively new to us. Graphite is awesome, because what we're able to do is throw all sorts of metrics out there. And so, for example, this is our repo user growth for the last year or so. And so we're basically doubling every six months in users and repos. And so we're actually getting to the point where we're, we're starting to realize that we can't keep buying servers at the rate that we're doing. We're going to have to start thinking of other ways to do this. And it's cool that we have this information because we at least know that that's on the horizon. And we, we are going to start dealing with it sooner than later. Um, and deployment is, you know, how we get fixes out to our users. We really like deployment. This is kind of something I've been doing for a long time. And part of deployment is moving fast. We want the deployments to be out super, super fast. And so, you know, the, a lot of times it's, it's only a few seconds to get code out. So it's somewhere between 17 and 200 seconds, uh, depending on the load on the servers at any given time. And we do this by not checking out the entire code base every time. Git has this really awesome thing where you just say, fetch origin, get me all the latest changes, reset hard to the branch. And that's how we deploy. And it's pretty cool because that allows us to have things like 17 second deploys. And it needs to be repeatable. We need to be able to <coughs> do this over and over and over because often we deploy more than 20 times a day. And that seems kind of crazy. And people are like, oh, what's your QA and all this? And it's like, well, when you move really fast, you just say, oh, well, that screwed up, roll it back. Or not even roll it back. Like, Hey, let's do some other cool things that 
allow us to not ever even have to roll that. Um, and what's cool about this is our designers can ship. Our designers don't say, well, I have to wait for a developer to do stuff. Our, des our designers change stuff, CI is green, they know how to do it. It's wonderful. Um, and so a normal deploy is pretty much like, you know, back to the future. Um, it, it does some really cool stuff, you're, you've got to go really fast and you're off. But we basically have a whole bunch of front ends and a whole bunch of file servers. And so on GitHub we have, you know, the master branch goes out everywhere, everything's good. So there's two ways that are really, really cool that we change it up in order to get code out there and evaluate how things are working. And I'm going to show you both of them. So topic branching. Uh, I showed a second ago that we do a hard reset to a specific branch. So when we use Git's cheap branching, we can say, hey, put my topic branch and go out there. And what's cool is this is able to go out to all the servers and you know, if things screw up, you don't have to merge to master and there's no rollback because you just deploy master again. And so you can roll it out and it's like, oh my god, site's unicorning, deploy master, boom. And that's, that can be fixed in under a minute. And I don't think many other people can, can work that fast. It's really, really a cool strategy. You know, and we use this for performance testing. So, you guys think I'm joking, but we do this all the time. Because what we want to do is send something out there, and we have, we have code that basically, like, you know, the tests are green on both code paths. But what is significantly more performant? And how are we really going to know that without putting it out there? So at the top of branch, we'll say, you know, okay, here's the new grid code, boom. Ship the stuff out there. Take a look, you know, look at all the metrics that we already have in place to see if it actually is faster. And if it is, we merge it back, or we just throw a master back out into production, iterate a little bit more, and try it again. And so we also have this thing called a subset deploy, which is really cool, because it allows us to do things like, you know, hey, maybe the grid upgrade only needs to go to the file servers, and maybe the top of the branch, we're just going to try that on 5 and 6. And this is really rad, because it allows us to evaluate newer, bigger changes and only impact a subset of the users. So this becomes really rad because like things like performance things that we want to address, we want to minimize error rates, or say we're upgrading a C extension and we just want to make sure it doesn't seg fault. We don't want the site seg faulting like, you know, on everybody. So it's like, let's say we're upgrading Nopagiri, which is a bad example because that wouldn't seg fault on you. But the, um, <laughs> but we do, uh, you know, we, I, I was being serious, I really love that. <laughs> oh, but you know, we can, we can throw it out there and watch it for a little bit and guess who can tell us if there are any seg faults on the servers? Qbot. And so it's really cool because we can do this and then it's just like, okay, everything's cool. Let's push it out to everybody. And then the subset deployment goes back to the, the normal status, which is master. But this is very common. Like we very often have multiple branches in production at one time. Like it, it's a really useful tactic for us. Um, and so we can do experiments, you know, without touching all of production, which is pretty rad. Um, and so what we've done in order to do this is we've written a library called Heaven, which is just like a simple Capstrano wrapper, but it feels like a Unix command. So it's just like Heaven, you know, A is the app, E is the environment, uh, but you know, for the second one, say we just want to do it on the front end hosts, so we can just do dash H front end or B my branch. And so we have a utility that we can run on, on our machines in order to ship, which works really well. But then, you know, the natural thing is we want Huot to do this for us. So we build an API on top of Heaven, and basically this is how Huot deploys. So the janky feedback is basically, the, this is pretty awesome, the, the propane hacks that we have put the build number there, so 195 is actually a link to our build output on our build server, and it's saying that, you know, that SHA built in 192 seconds, which is actually how long our tests take, and then Ryan asked him, you know, Hubot, what's not deployed? So Hubot can compare the running code on github.com versus the master branch at that point. And so you have a compare URL to see what's about to go out. And then Hubot just says, Hubot deployed GitHub in production. And Hubot tells everybody, you know, the, what the shot was at, what shot it's going to, compare URL again. And then it tells you that Ryan's Tomatoes production of <coughs> GitHub was done in 70 seconds. And so what's awesome is in Campfire, we have all of this information. We have the build output, we have the time that it took. And you, we, can, we can go back and look and see. Um, so yeah, there's the compare view. Uh, you know, Ryan's basically saying the app and the environment. And so we can also do the topic branch stuff. So you do like GitHub slash topic to production. We can also do the subset deployments there too. Uh, yeah, and then you get the duration. Um, and so you know, when we start thinking about how we're going to do features, all of a sudden those other deployment ideas make a whole lot of sense because we can sneak things out. Um, you know, and it's so we're, we're developing features and we're not giving them to everybody, but we're sneaking them into the system, seeing how they perform, and getting numbers around how much it's blowing up. And so we dog food all the stuff that we write. 
Like, if we don't like it, our users are not going to like it because we're all software developers. And so a lot of things, like I have stuff enabled on my account right now that, you know, is coming. But, you know, we can't turn it on for everybody until it's at a level that we're all happy with. Um, you know, and then we release stuff. So it's just like, you know, we do a blog post. Tell people why we spent time working our butts off on some feature and why their lives are going to be easier if they switch to it and keep using our site. You know, we keep an eye, keep an eye out for, for tweets and how people feel about it. Um, you know, and we listen to our users. It's like, we, we really do. It's, I don't know. The internet gives people the ability to just, you know, talk mad shit and be like, oh, this is terrible. I can't believe you guys did this. And it's like, yeah, I know. And that's, I'm sorry that you feel that way. But then when we see everybody else who's like, man, I'm so glad that they did this. It's like, yes, okay. You know, we're always going to get some negative feedback, but we keep a really close eye on what people say. Um, and just like, you know, that's, that's really it. Like, it it's, a, it's a whole lot to think about, and I hope that, you know, if, if you take anything away, it's just like, how can you guys work a little bit faster when you're shipping code? You know, how can you figure out that, you know, there, there are tons of different ways that may or may not be acceptable in your organization, but kind of push those boundaries in order to get code out to people faster. You know, and so just measure stuff. Like, you want to you be in a node. You want to say, if, if something changes, you want to be able to track it from multiple systems back to the source code that changed that introduced, you know, a performance issue. Um, develop your own stuff. Like, as much as I would like to open source Qbot and Haystack, like, the amount of maintenance that that would take for us right now isn't really in our best interest, and there's other tools that people can, can build. But having custom solutions around what you're building um, is, is a fun thing to work on that isn't your main product. Like, Qbot is fun to hack on. Even if he's just adding dumb stuff like <coughs> Cubot Dance Party, which is like an animated GIF of John Maddox at his desk. Like, it, and it's just like, why do they have this? I don't know. But it, it's a really good distraction. You know, and, and be responsive. Like, you know, we have days where we get like hot link from a porn site that's linking to a JS file. And it's like, what the hell do we do? You know, it's like, why is our traffic quadruple what it normally is on a Monday morning? It's like, oh, okay, we'll just ban it. You know, but you have to be able to do that. You need to know and be able to identify quickly why we have, you know, elevated load on all of our front end servers. Um, because, you know, like the, the lifecycle of your product is something that, you know, you can build and you want to take care of it, but you want to like, you know, you want to be able to measure, you want to watch it grow, and you want to care about it. Like I care about keeping getup.com available to people. And it's it's a really fun experience when you, when you look at it that way. So, you know, just basically ship it. This is the original ship and squirrel which is a whole lot cooler than the tanker one, the other one is the tanker. So, you know, both of those come up as, as shipping schools. But, you know, when just think, shipping should be fun. It shouldn't be this big, scary thing that you're like, oh, God, I can't ship on a Friday. And it's like, yes, you can. It's just, you might have to work later. Screw up. <laughs> but, but, if, you, but if you build a, a mechanism where you're, it's okay to fail, it's really easy to correct those errors in a timely fashion, and it's a whole lot of fun not to be scared to put things in front of you. So thanks a lot. Um, if you have any questions, I think I have like two minutes. If not, I'll be around. Um, so cool. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you do have to kind of be smart. I mean, you can't like roll out 
you know, a, a branch with migrations to a portion of the front end. Like that's just going to blow up. But so what we'd end up doing would be make an appointment with just the migration and run the migration on a, on a standalone server, and then you know go ahead and see the migration complete, and then go ahead and roll the code out that takes advantage of the new column, rather than taking the site down to do the migration. Um, so, um, but yeah, no, it's it, it really varies, and there has to there is some you know you have to understand how the systems work in order to to, to use it properly. But the people who are going to do crazy things that break it generally understand how they work. And for the most part, lowering the bar so you know our designers can ship from Campfire and they don't even need VPN keys is, is pretty rad. Um, so. Yeah. I was wondering what your rationale was for why continuous deployment from CI did not work for you guys. Uh, the topic branches. So if we were to deploy anything from the topic branch, um, then things would be out that were still just being developed, and we don't we want to be picky about when those go out. Um, so, and we also like Qbot also supports locking of deployments. So you can when you're doing a topic branch or a subset deployment, you can say Qbot lock GitHub, then you give it a reason. And when someone goes to ship, it's like, hey, it's locked because Ryan's getting some metrics around smoke. Um, and so, for us, the the advantage of being able to sneak the branches out is far outweighs having. Um, CI 